Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the Contemporary Challenges Confronting China series, which was which was began by Ezra Vogel, and we are have the honor to continue this series. And before I get into the introduce the speaker. Uh, Lynn, uh, I think Wendy Yep, the interim director of Fairbank Center, would like to say a few words. Uh, Professor Xiao, actually, she she doesn't need to say anything. You can continue. I see. I'm sorry, I got my signals incorrectly. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to intro uh, introduce Jing Or. Uh, I got to know Jean in the late 1980s. She was a professor at Harvard. And I was really impressed how much she knows about China, the field work she was doing in China, get to the, onto the ground. And she specializes in political economy but she approached it from the institutional side by looking at the process of reform at the micro level, but integrated with a macro policy. So linking them together. So I was duly impressed, but felt I really don't know enough even to ask her questions. Then soon after, Stanford poached her, took her away from Harvard, and she has been at Stanford. And now she's the William Hess Professor of Political Science, and also senior fellows in different centers at Stanford. But what's most impressive too is she's the head director of the Stanford Center in China at Beijing University. Every time I walk by her mansion, the Stanford Center in Be Beida, I just drool with <laughs> say, wow, would I like to have a, such a place? So I think Jean has done the great groundbreaking work for us to understand the physical reform and then the incentives that China conducted between the central government and the, the local governments and how the local governments were in, incentivized to actually to promote economic growth. And the, I will not go into it, she will uh, teach us uh, this time. But I want to tell you, she just published and co-edited a new book, The Faithful De Decisions. It's really, it's gonna be so worthwhile. I believe it's gonna be used as a textbook in all the courses teaching about the China and the future of China's development. I recommend highly you get a copy. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this session over to Jing. But before I do that, Nick will give us a few instructions. Hi, all. Um, if you haven't been here before, welcome. And if you have, welcome back. Um, as you know, uh, there is a time for question and answer at the end um, to ask a question at any point during the talk. All you need to do is click on the Q&A button in the at the bottom of your screen. Um, that will open up the question box. Uh, if you would like to ask a question anonymously, you can do so. Just make sure you check that option. Uh, if not, please let us know where you're from um, and institutional affiliations if you have any, uh, just so we know who's asking the question. All right, thank you. Oh. Thank you, Bill, for that very warm um, welcome. And I must say that you bring up Ezra 
And actually, the last time I saw you actually um, in person was at Ezra's house. Um, and so I'm particularly honored that I would be in this series that uh, Ezra uh, created. So, um, you know, we obviously miss him dearly. Uh, so let me then uh, move on to what I think is one of the critical issues uh, facing uh, China. I think that this uh, problem of local government debt is something that has been brought to the attention of um, everyone, uh, not just uh, you know in China, but outside of China. So you know, uh, news sources such as Bloomberg in 2018, you know, were you know big major headlines. You know, China has 5.8 trillion dollars in in uh, hidden debt, and Standard and Poor's downgrades China's sovereign debt rating by one notch. But I think most importantly, by 2017, the Ch central leading group on finance and economic affairs started talking about the gray rhino, i.e. this was they finally called out China's local um, government debt. And so the question is, I mean, first, let me tell you what a gray rhino is. And I must say, I had to originally look this up because I wasn't sure myself. But a gray rhino is something that is known as a threat, but it has received little attention. So the quest, first question is, why did it take so long for Beijing to actually call out to see that there was actually this gray rhino? Why didn't it confront this gray rhino earlier? It's not like a gray rhino is some small creature you don't see. I mean, as early as 2013, there was local government debt everywhere. So this chart that I'm, a graph that I'm showing, you know, it's every single province that, um, you know, that the uh, local government debt as a percentage provincial revenues exceeded 100% for all provinces. So, you know, this was already a problem uh, back then. And this uh, graph shows that the local government debt as a percentage of provincial GDP rose from 12% in 2007 to 54% in, in 2017. So clearly this is a uh, growing uh, problem. And then in a comparative study by OEC, uh, OECD, you see that surprisingly, actually, um, China has the highest government debt as a percentage of public debt, higher than you know all other countries, and even um, you know federal systems such as Canada, you know China. To remind people, even though people have talked about it as you know de facto uh, um, federalism, it's actually a unitary system. It should not have this much debt. But more importantly than the type of political system, there are actually laws on China's books that prohibit um, local governments from borrowing and from um, debt. For example, the 1994 budget law uh, mandates that there should be balanced budgets and there should be no deficits um, and that local governments shall not issue local government bonds. And most importantly, you know, in terms of thinking about how China could have local governments could have such debt, there is actually a prohibition against local governments borrowing from banks. And so they're supposed to have, this is not supposed to happen. And so let me, in explaining, you know, I'll give you my understanding of why there's this debt. Let me take you back to what I think is the origins, the genesis of local government debt. And that is China was facing a fiscal dilemma in, um, in the sense that the, the, the center was facing, facing a fiscal dilemma. China in 1993, right before, um, you know, this early, this was during Zhirong Ji's time, uh, the economy's booming, but the problem for the central government was that it was only getting 22% of revenues. And so instead you have localities, you know, uh, really accumulating massive amounts of this um, new revenue because the economy was booming. And this was in the form of, you know, extra budgetary funds. 
So for the center, the big question was, how was it going to get back more revenues? But at the same time, they also had to be very cognizant of how are they going to keep up the incentives? In other words, how is it going to keep the localities um, interested in uh, furthering development? And so here I um, put up a graph about the consequences of the 1994 reforms. That was the solution to um, the center's problems in about trying to, to, uh, to regain revenues. So to re-centralize taxes obviously is a win for the center, but it was at a real loss for the localities. And so on the right, um, I have a graph based on statistics from the National Bureau of Statistics that shows that you can see that in 1994, what happens? That this is the local, the, uh, the local uh, revenue share, and, but these are local expenditures. And so this gap in between, it's called the local, we call it the local fiscal gap. In other words, the difference between revenues and expenditures. And that was the impact of the 1994 uh, reforms. So the big question that we've always had, including in my own work, as Bill was alluding, I, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at um, local state development, is how did the localities manage? You know, how, why did local state-led growth continue after 1994? And since we know that it did continue, uh, the question then is, wasn't there a credible commitment problem? You know, didn't the, you know, why would localities continue to do this if they're taking away the uh, revenue surplus? The answer that I offer uh, today is that I uh, find in this research that actually Jurong G uh, 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 crafted a grand bargain in central local relations. And so he managed to come up with a deal um, where the center is able to re-centralize the taxes, i.e. he pushed through the 1994 reforms. But what's key and something that we have not known to this extent um, is that he made very uh, concerted uh, and, and explicit concessions to the localities to make up for lost revenues uh, uh, by instituting 1994. So what he did was he gave them the rights to non-tax revenues, i.e., you know, tax revenues that were, did not fall under this uh, category um, that was covered by 1994 reforms. And most importantly, he also provided new tools for localities to uh, continue uh, growth. And so, you know, there's a, a in the political science literature, you know, uh, Ron Winthrop talks about a, a dictator's dilemma. Uh, and in this case, it's sort of the dictator's fiscal dilemma and the problem of principle and agents, i.e., how does the center get its local agents um, in the localities to uh, comply. And so that the whole deal back in 1980 that spurred the growth uh, was that the center said, you know, the localities could keep the fruits of their development. Well, um, 1994 took that away. So by, but what he did was that he said, okay, I'm gonna make this up for you by giving you sort of new goodies. And so we know this uh, because uh, we have, for example, the, the Minister of Finance at the time, Xiang, in 1993, um, he says uh, very explicitly that they have to make concessions to align incentives. In other words, they have to win the hearts and minds of the localities. Um, and so this is really, I think, very uh, eye-opening, but most importantly are the memoirs of Jurong G himself. And by the way, I should make clear that this work is based on a, 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 a co-authored paper uh, with one of my former students, uh, Adam Lil, who now teaches in Singapore, um, who's done a great, did a great dissertation and now doing a book on uh, local state banks. And uh, so I'm drawing um, a lot from, uh, from his work, as well as with a former research scholar um, at Stanford, Zhang Yi. 
And so from Jurogji's memoirs, we see that the center actually um, uh, committed to tie its own hands. He says, total revenue and total spending are your, i.e. the locality's own secret. I only care about how much the center is getting. And he says further that the center would not intervene and give localities autonomy over local spending. The center will not intervene. And so basically, you know, the question of why didn't the center contain the, the um, gray rhino earlier, the agreement was it wouldn't. It, it, it agreed that it would keep that eye closed. And so what I um, want to share with you is exactly what happened, you know, what were the details of this deal? And so there was an institutional quid pro quo, uh, and that is that the uh, backdoor financing tools. Uh, and so this includes local state banks and these local financing, uh, local government financing vehicles that you probably have uh, heard of, the rooms of Ping Tai. And so first let's look at um, the, the banks. And this is from Adam's uh, dissertation um, that what happens is that Jural G, you know, turns over these local state banks, um, you know, gives these banks to the localities and you can see what happens. They just take off in terms of growth. And um, the, not only are they growing, but you can also see that in terms of asset share, that they are, they're also um, starting to, to, to be competitive with the four uh, big uh, state banks. And so I also want to make very clear that Jurong Ji was not giving away the store. Actually, Jurong Ji being Jurong Ji was very strategic. Um, and so what he did was in making these concessions, he actually was uh, unloading a problem that the central government had because those familiar with the um, sort of the, the financial institutions, the local financial institutions in the early 90s, is that they were really starting to go under. There were a lot of non-performing loans, uh, you know, and, and such. And so um, eventually the center had to step in, took them over, but that meant there were all these loans they had to clean up. And so what was fascinating is that Jurong Ji then decides, okay, I, I know what I'm gonna do with this. I'm gonna turn these over to local authorities. Um, and so the local authorities then paid to clear up the non-performing loans. But then once that was done, the localities had local state banks that they could then uh, use for their development purposes. So that's why I say Jurong Ji managed to kill two birds with one stone. And so he used this to push through the 1994 uh, reforms. And so the way this works is that um, the, the local state then has local state banks, but remember there was still a prohibition on local states being able to, uh, local governments being able to borrow from banks. So that wasn't sufficient. And so to get around this uh, regulation, what the local governments did was they created local government financing vehicles. They used people from their, you know, minute, their, their Bureau of, of uh, Finance, uh, not usually, and they created essentially a middleman, an institutional middleman that would do the borrowing for local government, for projects that local governments would identify and then handle this. And so, you know, this, this local government financing vehicles have been um, uh, mentioned in various news reports and saying, oh, they're the real culprits. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, they've been, the, they were key players in creating local government debt. And, um, sorry. And so the, the question then becomes, okay, so how did they do it? And you probably have also heard about land finance. There are all these articles, you know, that have caused, you know, land grabs, particularly in Wukan, for example, down in Guangdong. So it's some really uh, high profile stories, but you can see this is from 2012. And this is based on an article by um, uh, Shu. Um, and, and you can see that, you know, this was a percentage of um, local debt 
uh, that was based on land sales. So what happens is that these local government financing uh, company vehicles, uh, these companies, they basically get land from the local governments who are able to take them at low, in other words, acquire the land through their administrative power. And so they obviously get them at low prices. They give them to the local government financing vehicles. They can flip the land or they can use the land as collateral at banks. And so that is how local governments were able to rack up all this debt. Um, that's how they did the, uh, the borrowing. And I want to say that um, this actually, you know, it sounds like a crazy thing that the central government would come up with a policy, a fiscal system that uh, they knowingly leave localities with a, a, this huge fiscal gap. But <laughs> it worked in the sense that this actually was a, was a feasible strategy with growth. For, you know, for growth, but it was growth with debt. In other words, it was debt fueled growth. And so the local government, the, the, uh, using local state banks and local government financing vehicles, localities, local governments could assume debt and to grow. And they also, this meant that this was the money that they used to fill the fiscal gap, to fund all these unfunded mandates that Beijing and upper levels uh, within the province set down to them and still stay within the formal prohibitions of the formal system, i.e. balance their budget. This is how it was done. But there were severe consequences for one, central local relations in that, uh, and this is, we know from Jural G is that this is the way it was supposed to be. This was part of the deal. There was less transparency in local government financial um, transactions, both in borrowing and in debt. And so that these concessions as part of the grand bargain um, were actions condoned by the central state itself. The Beijing opened the door to local government debt. And I would argue that local government debt was actually an expected outcome of the strategy. But I also think that at the time and given the very high growth rates that this was manageable because the idea was, you know, they could keep growing to, to take care of this, um, of this debt. And so the sort of the part of the so what uh, about all of this is that you have both centralization, but with decentralization, because the everybody thinks about the 1994 reforms as a re-centralizing uh, policy. And, you know, and, and it was in, in that sense, the localities um, uh, had to give up more and the center did re-centralize taxes. But in practice, once we peel back that one layer of the 1994 reforms and then looks at what happens, that you actually end up with that period being incredibly decentralized. And so I've argued that there was local state corporatism. And you know, after this, I would say that local state corporatism actually was strengthened rather than weakened by the 1994 fiscal reforms because the localities were given by Beijing uh, tools, including the state banks and then the local government financing vehicles that made backdoor financing very viable and they were given autonomy over these um, new revenues. Now, I know I'm drawing a lot at you, but this little, I don't know if you can see it, but this is sort of a, um, a, a, a little graphic to show you what is going on. So you've got Gerald G's grand bargain. You've got the center. They want the 1994 reforms, increased revenues. And so this, you get recentralization. On this side, you've got the localities. So the 1994 reforms, yes, he pushes it through, but he's got to, get buy-in from the localities. Um, and so what does he do? He, these are the count, I would argue the countervailing policies um, because the 1994 reforms created the fiscal gap, uh, but you know, and so what, what 
happens is that because Jurongji gave them these concessions, they had the right to the new revenue, local state banks, local government financing vehicles, land finance, and then I'll show you in a bit, um, they also then go into bonds. And so that, in fact, you have de facto decent, uh, decentralization, even though in principle on paper, it looks like it should be centralized. So that, so it worked, but what then changes? Why then do you have the system that seems to be working so well? Why do you all of a sudden then start uh, the center starts worrying about these gray rhinos. And what I argue is that the global financial crisis really changed, was a sort of a watershed moment. Uh, the global financial crisis and the stimulus package really changed the, you might say, the risk of a local government debt. And it really blew it up. And here you can see that starting with the global financial crisis, the China's debt to GDP ratio really starts to spike. Um, but it really doesn't spike, I mean, really spike until about 2012, 2013. And so what happens, uh, I argue, is that you basically have, and I think we all know that the stimulus package was, was huge in the amount of loans that were um, given out to the localities. Um, and so that the localities took the money and something else that I want to mention is that this money wasn't all free in the sense that not only did they um, have to pay back the loans, but in order to even get the loans, there was a, there were strings attached um, actually to things like fiscal trans, uh, certain types of fiscal you know, earmarked fiscal transfers, but also these, these stimulus loans where localities had to provide matching funds. And so here's a catch 22. It turns out that, you know, here you, you're a local official, you're, you're being offered money by Beijing, but Beijing says, okay, you know, in order for you to get this, you need to give us matching funds. But if you're a poor area, what do you do? you have a choice of going into getting a loan to get the loan or not taking the loan. And I think a lot of places decided, well, okay, we're just gonna go into debt because this way, hopefully we can sort of grow out of this problem. And you can see the massive increase because in mid 2008, you know, this is before the financial crisis, there was um, localities, local debt was something like 1.7 trillion. Uh, by 2013, June of 2013, it had grown to 17.9 trillion. You know, that's a massive, you know, increase um, over a five year uh, period. And so what was happening uh, here, you see that the, 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 and this is where it starts becoming a real problem. Localities, you know, the, the rate um, the amount of loans, but also the fact that these loans were coming due because most of the stimulus loans were relatively short um, maturity. And so they started coming due around 2012, 2013. And so that created a new problem. And that's when you start having a shift and an expansion of the type of debt um, that was being created. And so you start having a shift to non-bank borrowing. In other words, land finance was no longer sufficient. The localities had to expand beyond that um, to uh, uh, pay off, one, the bank loans. Um, and so what they did was that they, they sold municipal corporate bonds. Um, and these were sold uh, as part of actually the shadow banking system. They were sold as wealth management products. And uh, what's very interesting, again, is that, you know, the risk here, that it took, you know, there are two kinds of these municipal corporate bonds. There are some where they're safer than others. And the, the less safe ones are the ones that do not have the explicit guarantee. And you can see at the county, city, province uh, level, and at total, um, that it was only the explicit guaranteed bonds was a very small percentage 
uh, total only less than 15%. The rest of it was also implicit guarantees. Now, this is sort of the risky thing. So people are buying these. They're buying them because, you know, the returns are high. Um, and interestingly, you know, you might worry, well, you know, aren't people worried? Yes, no. I think because they have this idea that their local government, their government, they'll, of course, they'll get paid back. Um, I think just prompted people to buy them. Interestingly, now when you um, when you go to a bank, you can still buy these. But interestingly, that when you buy them, apparently they have they take a video of you um, uh, listening and saying yes, you understand that there is this is only you know, have an implicit guarantee. There's no explicit guarantee that you're going to actually get you know get get paid. Uh, and so I think that they they realize that this is uh, risky, and they don't want people, coming, you know, citizens on the streets, uh, you know, marching and saying, you know, your local governments really, you know, you're responsible for us uh, losing our money. And it's this implicit debt that is actually the gray rhino. And so that in um, and and um, uh, the People's Bank of China in a 2018 survey said implicit, you know, calling out this implicit debt. And it, it noted that in one provincial government, implicit debt was 80% higher than explicit debt. And between 2015 and 2017, uh, implicit debt accounted for more than 55% of bank borrowing. So in other words, the, 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 this whole economy, this whole, this whole system is sort of, you know, hinging on the sale of these bonds. So you know, can this great rhino be contained? Uh, you know, what are they, what are they going to uh, do about this once they realize what the problem is? So here we see that Beijing by 2015 is already quite aware that things probably can't stay the way they are. So Beijing says, all right, we're going to try to block the back door, not let this, you know, gray rhino go out and create more problems. And instead, we're going to open the front door wider. What does that mean? That means that the central government in 2015, um, they implemented a debt bond swap. So what that means is that the, the, the central government said, okay, we have, you know, we know that you have all of these local governments have a lot of, um, of debt. And, and these are, you know, mostly, uh, this is um, bank debt. And so they, they said that they were going to um, swap these out and exchange high interest local government debt, these bank loans to lower cost bonds with longer payback periods. And these are the centrally legally approved municipal bonds, what are called muni bonds, which are different than the, than the corporate, you know, the municipal corporate bonds issued by the uh, local government financing vehicles. And these bonds, there are quotas from them that are issued by central government. And they actually, the, the, the amount every year actually has to be approved by the local people's Congress. And so this then, uh, Beijing is able to reassert control and ensure transparency because they're giving the quotas to the localities. And so, you know, I, I'm, um, what, what I want, what's also very interesting is at about the same time, I think that Beijing is realizing, you know, you. They, they come once again, um, not full circle, but they're coming back and saying, okay, we still need to take care of the localities um, and give them some incentives. Um, and so that the, in terms of the, um, the center says they're gonna minimize this involvement in managing micro level fiscal affairs um, and to protect local interests. So at the same time that they've sort of coming in and, and, and trying to, um, uh, to uh, uh, 
provide some assistance for local government debt. They're also you know, then saying, uh, yes, we're taking away some of your power, but we still want to um, take care of you. And, and uh, I guess sort of the, because the problem, I think that the center is very aware is the fiscal system. Um, and so that uh, you see that the center is acknowledging its institutional problems. And in the 18th party Congress, um, they, I was actually very gratified that when reading the documents, all of a sudden somebody else realizes, you know, earmark funds are really problematic because the earmark fiscal transfers are those fiscal transfers that carry the strings, i.e. the matching funds. And so in 2013, it says, okay, we need to progressively abolish earmarks for competitive areas and local funding supplements. These are the matching funds I'm talking about. And then in 2016, the center goes further and says, all right, unfunded mandates, you know, that basically the, the, the center has to stop asking localities to fund projects that are dreamed up by um, the uh, upper levels as you know, well-meaning as they might be, including for things like education and health. If the center wants something done, they should pay for it. All right, so um, I, let me start wrapping up here. But I think that the fiscal dilemma continues. Um, and, and what's really interesting is that on the one hand, you see the Beijing starting to, to realize and okay, we, you, we have to make some changes to the fiscal system, but I would say that it's not enough. And so interestingly, in the fall of 2019, um, actually the last time I was in, able to be in Beijing, there was, uh, they made an announcement that they were going to let local government financing vehicles uh, go bankrupt. And um, which was fascinating. I couldn't believe they would do this. And I, I, I was, you know, talking to various um, people, uh, including uh, people, you know, researchers in, in central organizations, and they said, yes, the reason they're doing this is as a signal to let everyone know that the center isn't going to back all this local government debt and these bonds and such. Um, but I think that the problems have only been aggravated and certainly aggravated by um, COVID, which is really, you know, did a, a real job on the economy, uh, even though it seems to be doing better than our economy, for example. So this is, this is, um, this is I think, continuing difficulty. The center has um, given some concessions uh, to the localities, um, you know, since the, the fall of, of uh, 2019. So they agreed to double the amount, the share of the value added tax. They used to only get 25%, now they're getting 50%. And they're getting a share of the consumption tax. Interestingly, it's only on these luxury items and I don't quite know why exactly. Um, they've even also made proposals to have city based property tax, i.e. give localities a, a, a reliable local tax base. And one of the things they have done um, is that they also have decided, okay, clearly we need to increase the quotas for these municipal bonds. Um, and they even came up with special COVID bonds for this uh, purpose. But the question is whether that is enough or not. So let me, you know, sum up by sort of telling you what the so what is. Why, you know, why is it important to understand the genesis of local government um, debt? And I, I think this is very significant because uh, my argument, my finding suggests that the center knew the consequences of the 1994 reforms, um, that the local efforts to raise revenues was expected, and i.e. local government debt was part of this grand bargain. Um, and so this, I think, really changes or should change our view of the behavior of local level officials. Because you know, some of the, uh, the our people dismiss local government debt as just wild, wasteful spending by local officials. 
Um, and yes, there is corruption. Yes, there is some wasteful spending, but I would argue that um, actually Beijing created an institutional shortage, this, this fiscal gap. And so that this pushing GDP was not just a, a, a to get ahead, but I would argue it was, they had to, everybody had to do it. It's just that some could do it better than others. It, it was to survive. And it wasn't just wasteful spending, but for routine expenditures. And I can show you uh, later in Q&A if you want to see what the money was spent for. Um, and this also, I think, has tremendous understanding the root cause of this debt is important for thinking about how to assess the policies that Beijing uh, is adopting to try to control the problem. And so in 2013, you know, they uh, incorporated debt and debt element in the cadre evaluations. And yes, you know, debt might, you know, slow for a bit, but it then kept going up again because you, no matter how, how good of a cadre, how honest of a cadre you are, because of this institutional problem, you cannot help but having local government debt grow. And so they also have used the anti-corruption campaign to try to, um, uh, control it, but I would argue it's an intervening variable and it's not the solution. And then finally, they have um, mandated that local governments cut ties with the local government financing vehicle as if somehow that would solve the problem. That only worsens the problem because you then have these local government financing vehicles um, supposedly separated. And then the question becomes, how are they going to raise the money? And where is go government going to find the revenues to actually make up for this debt? Because the problem is that um, there is their need for deep institutional uh, reform. The local government debt is rooted in a flawed fiscal system. And here, um, I want to you know, thank Bill for putting up the book that Tom Finger and I just edited, because looking at the uh, prop, uh, local government debt, um, you, know, you can see that it very much fits into this pattern. Um, this local government debt was a political solution, actually. It was a consequence of a political solution to solve fiscal and financial challenges uh, that China faced in the mid-1990s. And but but the the whole strategy and this local government debt and how it's you know allowed to grow and then um, now it's become more of a problem is very characteristic of China's overall development model that leaders and China has been amazing that they've been able to get as far and do as much as they have by essentially circumventing rather than tackling um, the most difficult institutional reforms. Um, and so they kept kicking the can down the road. This was a solution that, that was feasible, you know, in the mid 1990s. And, you know, that, that, that they, everybody thought, okay, you know, this, we could, we could manage this, we will work and localities, you know, complied. But I would argue that local government debt will continue without um, the deep inst institutional reforms uh, needed for the fiscal system. So once again, you know, you've got these, uh, the adoption of short term solutions that have um, long term consequences. Um, and with that, I will uh, end and I look forward to questions and comments. Thank you very much for that enlightened presentation. It really educates all of us on the problems that China faces with the total debt. And so much of it has been incurred by the local government through the institutional arrangement that Zhu Rongji established, but that now it just becomes too light. So the Randall, Randall, uh, the brave runner you have is now become visible. <clears throat> yes. And the question is, what do, you, what do you think, Mike? So I'm going to take the privilege ask you the first question. Yes, Since please. you have been studying this and you just wrote that, co-edited the book 
faithful decisions. What do you think China can do to address this problem? Well, or likely to do? The what they need to do, and I, I want to say that I think that Xi Jinping and the leaders in Beijing, they identified the need for fiscal reforms a long time ago, years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but the question is, are they going to carry through with it? And I want to say that I'm very sympathetic because it's extremely complicated. And the other thing about this whole um, a local government debt um, is that it has wide ramifications for the implementation of all sorts of other policies, uh, including health. But also, let me just talk about the policy, the HUCO policy, and the way that migrants are treated in different um, localities. I found out that the way that the budgeting system works, and Bill, you probably already know this, but you know when when um, a, a local governments are trying to uh, figure out the, to, to to get their budgets, their uh, allocations from the upper levels are based on the number of people who have legal urban huko in their locality. I see the registered huko. So this explains why they are not so happy to have all these migrants. It's not that they're terrible people, but they got to figure out, OK, where am I going to get the money to provide all these public goods and such? So it's really complicated. So what are you going to do? So this is like one of these problems that you it's not just you know, changing one system, you've got to change all these other things that are connected with it, but they need to figure out how to provide the localities with a stable revenue. If they're going to keep to the original, uh, you know, division of revenues, then, uh, you know, they uh, should try to come up with a, a local uh, tax, uh, you know, a, a property tax. But then we know that, you know, the the the, the uh, local officials in in big cities, for example, are then going to worry what's this going to do to the middle class, particularly in cities where a lot of them own property, two or three apartments. They're not going to be happy with having to uh, start paying property tax. So I do not have a solution, but they need to figure to, to really tackle this problem, get their experts and tackle this problem. And I think it's only going to get worse because right now, because of COVID, I understand that um, revenues uh, all over the country, actually, in the last couple of months, there's a, a quite a sharp decline uh, because a lot, in particular, because a lot of the small and medium sized enterprises have gone under because of COVID. Thank you. Uh... Here's a question from Yvette Timberham and, and says, hello, Jane, great talk. Do we have survey data or information on whether the large public understand the situation? I assume she meant the Chinese public. Given the risk involved, how will the government manage to build support for either local property tax or potential bankruptcies and losses for the middle class? This is very interesting question. <clears throat> I have to say that um, I, when I give talks on local government debt in China, um, I think that a lot of people, uh, there aren't that many people that understand this and and actually, there was a funny little thing where I gave a talk uh, on local government debt at, at Tsinghua, and somebody wrote that, boy, you had to, this is such an important topic, and we have to have a foreigner come and tell, tell us about this. So I don't think that there is um, deep understanding of this problem, because if you think about it, you, and this is why I said that it was, in some ways, a very feasible and workable project. Local governments, you know, kept growing. They would do this land, they would do this development. And 
I don't think that um, most citizens actually understand the 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 um, the risks involved. And I have to say, you know, because people sometimes ask me how dangerous is it, and I and I'm not an economist. I don't and the economists. I don't know, Bill. You could Bill overhaul. You know, you might be able to jump in here. But uh, you know, one of the things about local governments that makes them different from local governments in other countries, including the US, is that local governments actually have assets. You know, they've got land, but they also have other assets, including, you know, enterprises and things uh, that they could uh, sell. The question is just how much liquidity is there? And I think it's the liquidity that may be what is creating more risk if they needed the money quickly. Um, and in terms of Educating the public on property tax. Well, you know, um, and I think that 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 probably is the way they're going to have to go. Uh, but I, you know, it's going to be tough. It's going to be a tough sell. Uh, and in part, I think is that it's this issue of entitlement. I think that, and particularly mm -hmm. with sort of the younger generation, they've really lived in the good times and, and, and they've not been asked to tighten their belts and such. And so maybe they're gonna start having to do that. Very good answer. Uh, but you give me a, a opening, on a burning question on my mind. Mm -hmm. And you point out Chinese government own the land. Yes. Even if they lease it, it's only leased for a term. China being a socialist country owns the land as well as many state enterprises. So when we look at the debt in you know, financial terms, you need to look at what asset do they have? Right. That's the point you bring out. <clears throat> so using Western views and analysis seems to me missing a major point about China's problem. China could liquidate that to require institutional reform, even change the nature of the uh, socialist country. But they can sell the land. For example, people who buy the bonds or the debt say, okay, now I give you the land into perpetuity. Well, I give you shares of the state enterprises. So the government actually have much greater asset than what typically in the other countries have. How do you, what do you see that? Yes, um, I, I agree. And I've asked some local officials, you know, aren't you worried? And, and their answer, one of their answers was, well, I actually have assets, you know, that I could, I could use to take care of this problem. But one of the interesting things that's happening and, and here is that because, you know, China, for example, uh, during the Asian financial crisis back in 97, did not have the same hit, did not take the same hit as countries like Korea. And one of the problems with Korea is that they had a lot of foreign debt. And so up until now, very recently, I don't think there was, and Bill Overhaul can probably cor correct me, but one of the things that's fascinating, but also worrisome, <laughs> is that these local government bonds, they apparently become hot sellers on the international market because of the, re of the high returns. So that then brings up the question of, if you start getting a lot of foreigners, I mean, in foreign investment that are not gonna be as willing to settle things within the family, as you, we might say, that could create new problems. And I think some um, other foreign you know, companies and such are starting to take uh, foreign loans. So that could complicate things, but I agree. There, this is the really unique aspect of local governments um, that 
would mediate the risk. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, there are several questions or about the local government financing vehicle. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, and I'm going to group them together. Okay. And uh, one question about the local financing vehicle is if you let, let them bank go bankrupt, what would be the impact? Who would, and the, and the uh, related question is the local financing platform differs by locality or by region. Do you, do you see a difference on the impact of these local financing that varies by different locality and region? Third, third question is related to this is what institutional reform in greater detail that you believe is required to alleviate the, to maybe remove or reduce the local financing platform? Um, yes, let me just say that uh, in terms of, of bankruptcy, the first one, bankruptcy, mm -hmm. they actually, um, I don't know if they've actually done it. They've announced it. I know that they have actually let um, local governments, I mean, sorry, local state banks, uh, there are three of them now that have gone, um, that they let go bankrupt. Um, and this thing about local government financing vehicles, one of the interesting questions, for example, is, uh, do they have to pay a premium? So in other words, do localities with greater risk, poor, uh, uh, do they have to pay higher yields um, on, their, on their bonds? I mean, this is a question that I'm actually trying to do some empirical research on to see how bonds are priced. And, and if, the, 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 if there is a difference in bond prices, I'm doing a paper with some people at Renda, some finance people, trying to figure this out to see you know, if there's this type of variation. But the, the thing about the local government financing vehicles, it's really fascinating. And it took me the longest time to figure out how these things work. And I finally got to interview some people the, uh, I got to interview some, um, some people that were actually in one. And so a locality has many local government financing vehicles. And it turns out that it seems that they have one for each major project. So those who are familiar with Beijing and particularly Beijing University, oh, by the way, Bill, if you ever want to come and spend some time at our center, it's, uh, please let me know and we'll, we'll give you an office. Um, but um, in, in, at, at the, the number four line outside of the east gate of Beida, there's actually a government, a local government financing vehicle for that project. And so each project has a local government financing vehicle. And so it's not that the more, um, uh, that the poorer provinces have the most um, local government financing vehicles. As a matter of fact, you also, um, if I can find this, uh, I've got a, a, a chart that actually shows the numbers of them by, uh, by province. So it really varies. And I must confess, I then lost track of the rest of the questions because there were so many. So what part didn't I answer? <laughs> let, me just, let me just show you um, this one, this one graph that actually is the number of local government finance vehicles by province. And that was just in 2014. And so that Zhejiang has the highest. Um, so you got Zhejiang, Sichuan, Guangdong, Fujian, 
um, in Jiangsu. And, and, and actually the poorer ones are down at the other end. Um, so, you know, I, we haven't done enough because enough of, um, of uh, the research to really know, but it would be fascinating to be able to speak in more detail about the differences in them. But these sort of things are very hard to do research on. Oh. Bill, you're muted. Bill, you're muted. Yes, thank you. Uh, here's a question going back to 1994 by Yu Hua. Uh, it says, thank you, Jane, for a great presentation. Could you say something about why the 1994 fiscal year deal with a credible commitment, credible commitment. I'm sorry, why? Why, it, why the 1994 deal with the credible commitment? Okay, that's a- Why did the government trust the center when that takes their autonomy away at that time? Okay. Especially when leaders change. Okay, that's a great question. Um, you know, this question has been bothering me. Uh, 1994 and credible commitment has been bothering me for a long time. Because when I wrote World China Takes Off, I made the argument that, well, there was still credible commitment because it wasn't that the center took away everything. They did leave them some uh, portion of the surplus under the um, 1994 reforms themselves, but I was never quite confident that that would be enough. And the reason why I argued that this grand deal was uh, uh, really uh, the way they fulfilled their credible, uh, made their commitment credible, is that they, Jurulji explicitly said, when he went on this tour, he took something like 70 people from Beijing and he did this tour of something like 17 provinces. And he went to each province and said and to, to lobby and to, to really persuade uh, local officials. I think he went to Guangdong first. And to, to say, okay, I know this is gonna be a hit. You don't need to worry. We're gonna give you this extra revenue, but most importantly, he then followed up and said, and here are the concrete tools by which, you know, you can generate new growth and that you can keep this, keep this revenue. And so, I mean, the question that you asked, you know, how, how could they trust the leaders? They changed. Well, on the one hand, it's one of these things, right? On the one hand, did they have a choice? No, not really. That that they could have, I mean, because on the one hand, when you're thinking about a one-party system, they would say, okay, they're authoritarian. These guys have no choice down there. But at the same time, I think that what this shows is that even in an authoritarian system, the principle, you know, during GD, the people in Beijing realize that they really need active buy-in from the, their agents in the localities. And so it was one of these things where, all right, we're gonna do this. We're gonna, we're gonna give you these, these new pots of money. And over time it worked. It's just like the, it's just like the 1980 reforms, right? When it first started, you know, did they all um, think it was their way? They really were going to be able to, to uh, profit from these new reforms? Well, some of them probably had some doubts, but I think that quickly they realized the money was piling up in the localities. Okay. Uh, it, it was a tough question. It's really about trust. It's about yeah, trust. So the it's about trust. And power. I think that, and right. this is one of these interesting um, dynamic aspects of Chinese politics that this type of and these and the and this memoir by Zhu Ji I think puts a new light 
on the degree to which the center does need to, or has actually paid attention to the localities. Yes. You have a question from your colleague and uh, uh, who also served on your thesis committee, I think. That's Marty White. So why has it been so difficult and delayed to try to introduce property taxes on things like housing? It seems to be so obviously necessary. Yeah, That's well, Marty, White. yes. Um, I think that the, as I was trying to say before, it's a question of political support. And again, you know, we think about Chinese politics, of Chinese political system, there are no national elections, but leaders very much care about, um, let's put it this way, they're concerned about protests, they're concerned about discontent, and the idea that you're going to start taxing the middle class is something that, um, I think local the officials are not sure that they're able to do because the middle class, you don't want these people out there, you know, demonstrating you. Are, and, and now, I mean, during this period that probably the chances would probably be less, but in the past they have. Um, they went out and protested against, you know, the, the building of incinerators near, um, you know, uh, near housing complexes and such. So it's a question of, of um, political stability. Let me change to a slightly different direction. The question is asked, is there any relationship with the local government that and the debt related to the um, the road and Belt and Road. Yes, Belt and Road. I'm sorry. <clears throat> yes, actually, this is a fascinating question. I never thought about this um, until I was sitting in. I spent some time in Singapore, and you know, there was a lot of interest in Belt and Road there, and I ended up at a couple of conferences, and. I, um, because, you know, we have this image of the Belt and Road as uh, something that is very much, you know, centrally organized and such. And then the people I was listening to, they were talking about all these sort of people going through local networks and, and you know, these uh, uh, clan ties and such. And, and then, you know, I've obviously been busy working on this local debt problem. And it occurs to me, and I think, and I now have some evidence for this, is that local governments, because one of the things that happened is that the center started cracking down and saying, okay, you have to reduce local government debt. And that means that, you know, they couldn't do a lot of the infrastructure, they couldn't do a lot of development. So what did local governments do? Local governments are using this local Belt and Road Initiative and it's easier for some governments than others because you know they happen to you know they can make a credible story that yes we're on the belt and road and i think that they're uh, using the belt and road as a way to generate more revenue they're using belt and road initiative as a, as an excuse for uh, engaging in certain kinds of development that would have been um, said, you know, no, you can't do this because that creates more debt. But if they can justify it under Belt and Road, then um, I think that makes it uh, okay. And there actually may be funding. But local governments, I think, are going on the Belt and Road and actually in, engaging um, in projects outside. Uh, to generate new revenues, to make up for this fiscal gap. Good insight, thank you. Uh, this will be the last question because really you've been bombarded with all this is great. varieties <laughs> of questions. Uh, this is from uh, uh, somebody who knows you, may not Tai from University of Connecticut. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. She said, we know there are many, uh, China has multi-level local governance structure. 
Could you say more about the debt problem facing different levels of local government? Do they have different levels of debt and the different capabilities to handle these challenges? As a matter and of- And then corollaries, can township issue bonds? Okay, as a matter of fact, unfortunately, this is a little dated, but um, we do have some data uh, that uh, shows the debt by administrative level. And this is um, only uh, 2013, but we've divided it up by partly guaranteed, guaranteed and debt that must pay. This is something I didn't actually even get a chance to, um, to talk about in the, in, the, um, in the talk. And this is the other fascinating thing that this local government debt, it, it, it's not clear. It's actually explicitly uh, stated that some debt, um, the government um, actually never has committed to, to really repay. It's sort of partially guaranteed. And it's sort of like, again, this implicit debt. And so you can see that um, at the city level, uh, you've got a lot of debt that has to be repaid. Townships also have, um, uh, you know, debt, but I don't think that they're issuing, uh, I, do, I can't say that with certainty, but I would imagine that most of the municipal corporate bonds are issued by the county level, um, uh, local government financing vehicles and above. I don't know because the data that we have actually comes mostly from city and province. There are a few county ones. I've not run across any from uh, township yet. Well, let me give a heartfelt thanks for this wonderful presentation. And you stimulate the many, many questions. And I urge those who's questions will not answer right to Jean directly she, or read her book and papers, you may find some answers there. And uh, thank you, Jean, for this informative uh, educational talk. And you well, opened our eyes. Well, thank you very much. And it's always great. And I loved all the questions. So thank all the audience and all my friends that I, have, that I hope to see sometime soon and to see okay. you as well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.